Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to call to order the regular meeting of the Newport News School Board for Tuesday, November 13th, 2018. On behalf of the members of the school board and our superintendent, I welcome each of you present and watching. Our quorum is present to transact the business of the school division. The school board member, Mr. Uh, Marvin Harris, is excused from this particular meeting. Uh, we will begin our meeting with the invocation and the place to the flag. Here to do the honors are two <coughs> students from Stanford Elementary, uh, Ms. Charlie Silva and Kendall Brown. Uh, first, Ms. Kendall will come forward and provide us with the invocation. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself, and then she will be followed by uh, Ms. Charlie. <coughs> Is that correct? Hello, my name is Kendall Brown, and I'm from Stanford in a third grade class. Ms. Bright builds. My favorite subject is art, and my second favorite is writing. I don't know how it happened, but one day I had a problem. I didn't want it. I didn't ask for it. I really didn't like having a problem, but it was there. Why is it here? What does it want? What do you do with the problem, I thought. I wanted to make it go away. I shoot it, I scout it, edit, I tried ignoring it, but nothing worked. I started to worry about my problem. What if it swallows me up? What if my problem sneaks up and gets me? What if it takes away all of my things? I worried a lot. I worried about what would happen. I worried about what could happen. I worried about this and I worried about that. And the more I worried, the bigger my problem became. I wished it would just disappear. I tried everything. I could, I could to hide from it. I even found ways to disguise myself, but it still found me. And the more I avoided my problem, the more I saw it everywhere. I thought about it all the time. I didn't feel good at all. I couldn't take it anymore. This has to stop, I declared. Maybe I was making my problem bigger and scarier than it actually was. After all, my problem hadn't really swallowed me up or attacked me. I realized that I had to face it. So even though I didn't want to, even though I was really afraid, I got ready and I tackled my problem. When I got face to face with it, I discovered something. My problem wasn't what I thought it was. I discovered it had something beautiful inside. My problem held an opportunity. It was an opportunity for me to learn and to grow, to be brave, to do something. It showed me that it was important to look closely because some opportunities only come once. So now I see problems differently. I'm not afraid of them anymore because I know their secret. Every problem has an opportunity for something good. You just have to look for it. Thank you. Miss yeah. um, Charlie, will you come on up? And tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> I'm I'm Charlie from Sanford Elementary in Miss Brightfield's third grade class. And my favorite subject in school is reading because it fills my mind with creativity. And, and this whole thing reminds me of one of our greetings that we do in the, in the morning, which is a little known fact about me. <laughs> Please rise as we now say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now for the moment of silence.
You may now be seated. Thank you. Well, um, I think we owe these two young ladies another round of applause. Well, we had two readers, and wow, she, Kenu, you read that with so much conviction. And uh, Charlie, you led us uh, perfectly uh, through the pledge and through the moment of silence. And I hope that was for those um, who were in the military and, and Veterans Day and that thing, so those folks who are having tough times out west with the fires and those things. So we want to again thank you and supporting Charlie and Ken do tonight on their family and their school's family. Would you please stand to be recognized? And the board uh, appreciates your encouraging these two young ladies and actually bring them here to the meeting this evening. So again, thank you very much and a job well done. <laughs> Our next item on the agenda would be uh, board recognitions. And I think we do have some of those today. And so if uh, Dr. Parker, would you join me in front and oh, sure. we'll, we'll come down. All right. the pleasure of presenting this month's school board recognitions. Ensuring that young people are financially literate is paramount to prepare them for future financial success. Two of our recognitions this evening illustrate the district's success in this area. Working in support of education, or WISE, is an educational organization dedicated to building financial literacy, fostering business and social entrepreneurship, and preparing students for college and global workplaces. The organization's literacy certification program provides high school students with financial education and the opportunity to become certified financially literate. Students learn more about personal finance when they take the Y standardized financial literacy certification test. This evening, we're pleased to recognize two Newport News high schools that are named 2017-2018 Blue Star Schools for their students' successful performance on the National WISE Financial Literacy Certification Test. Please join me in congratulating Warwick High School. I'd like to call the CTE team up from Warwick High School as well as their interim principal, Mike Nichols. Um, Woodside High School was also named a Blue Star School, and accepting on behalf of their school um, community are their CTE teachers and their assistant principal, Grace Foley. Would you please come forward? In order to earn the WISE Blue Star School designation, a school student must have 80%, an 80% pass rate on the literacy certification test with either a majority of students at any given grade level taking the test or an average of 85% or higher by all students who take the test. This national standardized test is administered to students at the end of the personal finance course. Students who pass the test receive a financial literacy certification. To all of you, please share our congratulations with the other stu the students and the staff. Thank you.
Our next honorees, so don't get too comfortable, also earned recognition through the WISE Financial Literacy Program. As educators who teach the Career and Technical Education course in personal finance, they are striving to ensure that their students develop the skills for lifelong successful financial decision making. Twelve Newport News educators have been named 2017-2018 Gold Star Teachers because at least 93% of their students in at least one of their classes passed the WISE Financial Literacy Test, which is also a Virginia Board of Education approved certification. They are joining us this evening. Please come forward. From Denby High School, Lisa McAllister. And Linda Richardson, a retired educator, also earned uh, a Gold Star Award. So we'd like to congratulate her as well. <laughs> From Heritage High School, Tiffany Smith. <laughs> also named Gold Star Teachers. From Minchville High School, Adrian Caldwell. in Diane Zawadzki. From Warwick High School, Michael Bellamy. Kimberly Grant. Lisa Jones. and Reginald Neely. From Woodside High School, Stephen Brown. Joella Evans. And Tina Shorter. The Virginia Standards of Learning for Economics and Personal Finance requires instruction in economic concepts, and teachers have to help students develop thinking skills that include economic reasoning, decision making, and problem solving. High school students have to meet a state requirement to complete a one credit economics and personal finance course prior to graduation. With the help of these dedicated educators, our students are not only satisfying a graduation requirement, they're earning state and national certification. These dedicated educators are also, were also recognized earlier this month at the Money Power Conference for Financial Literacy in New York City. Again, thank you for helping our students with the tools and the life skills they need to become college, career, and citizen ready. Thank you. We'd like to hold you for a picture. <laughs> Make sure I have a window. Yeah. Hey, Neil, you got to take, take a knee, man. If there are students, I think if there are students do well on that test. And the teachers yeah, the yeah. teachers get the reward. Yeah. Sorry, we're on the floor. Okay. When do we start? Soon. Uh, I have some 
And I also want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, any family members who join these educators this evening um, and also their school administrators. Would you please stand and be acknowledged? And I'd also like to acknowledge our career and technical education supervisor, Tonette Outland. The Dorothy McCullough School Nutrition Award celebrates Virginia school divisions that have gone above and beyond by operating all available federal child nutrition programs and achieving stellar participation in the school breakfast program. The award is named in honor of our former First Lady of Virginia, Dorothy McCullough, in recognition of her efforts to end childhood hunger in the Commonwealth. For the second year in a row, Newport News Public Schools has earned this award presented by No Kid Hungry Virginia. In recognizing the 2018 winners, Mrs. McCullough said, this year's school division winners are great examples of how to effectively implement and expand nutrition programs so their students have access to the nutrition they need in the classroom and lead healthy lives. It takes a dedicated team to ensure that our students have access to nutritious meals at school. To accept this recognition on behalf of the Child Nutrition Services team, please join us in congratulating the Supervisor of Child Nutrition and Wellness, Debbie Pascal. <laughs> Area Cafeteria Supervisor, Christine Del Grazo. <laughs> and Area Cafeteria Supervisor, Christine LeMaster. The Executive Director of Child Nutrition, uh, Kathy Alexander, was unable to join us this evening, but we wish her well. To qualify for this award, our Child Nutrition Services team <coughs> exceeded the criteria governing breakfast, after-school meals, and summer meals. Newport News Public Schools serves a nutritious breakfast to all students free of charge. 39 schools serve free lunch to all students. Our staff also serves after school meals or snacks for after school program participants and athletes. And during the summer, three meals are served to students in SPARC and other programs and free lunch is provided at several sites for the city's youth. Only 13 school divisions in the state earned this recognition for 2018, and Newport News Public Schools was the only division in Tidewater to earn this award. Team, congratulations on this honor, and thank you for all you do to support our students. And congratulations. This month is the Virginia School Boards Association Take Your Legislator to School Month. In an effort to promote a closer relationship between public education and the Virginia State Legislature, the Virginia School Boards Association encourages each school division to invite state legislators to visit their schools during November. One of the goals is to create opportunities for productive dialogue so that educational and political leaders can work together to ensure that we provide the best possible education for our students. Students will also have the opportunity to interact with elected officials and learn more about the roles and responsibilities of the Virginia Assembly members. To commemorate this observance, 
Governor Ralph Northam signed a proclamation. In summary, some of the highlights include, whereas a strong and effective public school system is essential to the economic prosperity of Virginia and ensures that we continue to make social, technological, and scientific advancements, and whereas school boards and legislators must work together to promote high academic standards and excellent facilities that help all of Virginia's students become productive, hardworking individuals. And whereas Virginia school boards play a vital role in fostering close relationships between schools and legislators to strengthen and improve Virginia's public education system. In honor of Take Your Legislator to School Month, Newport News Public Schools is hosting a tour and a dialogue on Wednesday, November 28th to highlight some of our programs and student accomplishments and our school building needs. We look forward to welcoming our state legislators, city council, school board, and local business leaders later this month. This week marks the annual observance of American Education Week, when school districts across the country celebrate and showcase public education. Our school district is commemorating American Education Week by focusing on our mission, ensuring that all students graduate college, career, and citizen ready. Schools are hosting special events and showcases. Each week, our schools are posting promotional messages and publicizing how students are becoming college, career, and citizen ready through their social media using the hashtag NNPSProud. Many of our social media followers are also sharing these posts. So we invite our family members, PTAs, booster clubs, and the entire community to join us in promoting the great things happening in Newport News Public Schools. Again, we congratulate all of our honorees this evening. This concludes the recognition portion of the meeting. At this time, we'll take about a seven minute break so that our honorees and their guests may choose to leave if you wish to do so. During this time, our viewing audience will have the opportunity to view this month's school board spotlight. So we'll stand in recess for about seven minutes. Thank you. High school graduates in Newport News Public Schools are moving beyond state standards and setting a new goal of excellence. In 2018, more NNPS students graduated on time, and each year, less and less students are dropping out of school. Both of these stats are far beyond the average found across the Commonwealth. The 2018 graduating class in Newport News sustained last year's historic on-time graduation rate of 93%, which is higher than the state average of 91.6%. The graduation rate has increased significantly from 72.9% a decade ago in 2008. An Achievable Dream High School stands out with a 100% graduation rate for the third year. And more students are staying in school with the NNPS dropout rate decreasing from 12% in 2008 to just 2.1% in 2018. This current dropout rate is lower than the state average of 5.5%. In 2008, Newport News Public Schools established a national award-winning dropout prevention and recovery program, online courses, graduation coaches, and community-based education are just a few of the programs that assist students in graduating on time and excelling in the classroom. Newport News Public Schools has cause to celebrate after receiving a generous grant from the Department of Defense and the National Math and Science Initiative. The grant of almost $800,000 will implement a college readiness program at Denby, Heritage, and Warwick High Schools which will give all students access to the advanced classes needed for academic and career success in the 21st century. The National Math and Science Initiative, or NIMSI, 
is focused on broadening access to rigorous advanced placement courses for all students, while also ensuring that military-connected students have access to high-quality educational opportunities. To this end, NIMSI's College Readiness Program will increase the number of students taking and excelling in college-level math, science, and English courses at three NNPS high schools. The grant funds teacher training, extra study sessions, additional classroom materials, and advanced placement exam fees. During a breakfast celebration in the Marriott at City Center, school system administrators were joined by local and state officials, commanding officers from Joint Base Langley Eustis, local business and community leaders, along with NIMSI and DOD representatives. Students from the three benefiting high schools shared how their magnet programs are preparing them to be college, career, and citizen ready, and entertained the audience with their musical talents. NIMSI's College Readiness Program is already in over 1,000 public high schools across 34 states, and the results are overwhelmingly positive. Through NIMSI's support, Newport News Public Schools anticipates our high school students and staff to write their own stories of success. At Hilton Elementary School, students use miles to measure their amount of fun. For the fifth annual Hilton Hustle 5K and Mile Fun Run, students, staff, and friends came together on a Saturday morning, running and cheering with costumes on to celebrate 99 years of academic excellence at Hilton. Once again, Hilton's PTA and a small army of devoted volunteers presented a successful hustle for the school and community to enjoy. 263 runners made this year's event the biggest yet. As the PTA's largest annual fundraiser, the Hilton Hustle provides resources and supplies to support academic success in the classroom. After a fun warm-up session with CNU's basketball team, young runners sprinted off for a one-mile fun run. Principal Annette Walls proudly handed out medals to each runner, while former principal Barbara Nagel cheered on runners disguised as the cat in the hat. Runners of all ages and abilities enjoyed the scenic 5K race through historic Hilton Village, while many participants competed in a number of contests, including most creative costume and wildest tutu. With the Hilton hustle growing each year, the Herons can't wait to see what next year's centennial birthday celebration will bring to the starting line. Caring for others is an honorable calling, and many compassionate individuals naturally gravitate towards careers in the health sciences, where knowledge, skills, and attentive care support health and wellness for people across the world. Extensive training and years of advanced studies are needed in this career cluster, so Newport News Public Schools is proud to offer the Governor's Health Sciences Academy at Warwick High School, giving our students a head start towards a successful career in healthcare. Health Sciences is the fastest growing career field at Hampton Roads as well as across the nation. And of course, many of these occupations offer a lucrative salary range, which means students must be well educated and prepared to compete for these high demand jobs. The Governor's Health Sciences Academy at Warwick High School is prepared to offer students the keys to success by excelling academically through experiential learning as well as opportunities to gain college and career readiness skills earn industry certifications while in high school, and help others through community service. Warwick provides four pathways through the Health Sciences Academy that allows students to specialize in the career field that interests them. Students who successfully complete the academy will be well on their way to a rewarding profession as a registered nurse, physical therapist, lab technician, massage therapist, research scientist, or a number of other related careers. 
If you're interested in jumpstarting your future STEM career by attending Warwick's Governor's Health Sciences Academy, talk to your school counselor or contact Warwick High School. Um, hello, uh, welcome back and hope that you enjoyed our school board spotlight. During our meeting, we provide time for the public to address the board. These are scheduled at the early part of the meeting and then near the end of the agenda. The board is very interested in your ideas and opinions and we wish to hear from you. And your this is for your opportunity for your input on the operations and the policies of the school division. However, this is an opportunity for the board to listen to your comments, and as such, the board will not engage in dialogue with the speaker or the audience. Speakers with specific questions will be referred to the superintendent or the appropriate office. So that everyone who desires to address the school board may have a time to speak, we ask that you comply with our three minute time limit. Uh, when you begin, a green light comes on, a yellow light signals you have 30 seconds remaining, and then a red light and a beep, we ask that you would conclude your comments. So at this time, we do have some cards, but in a sense of a well, protocol, I like to call it, we do have an elected official uh, that's in the audience, and I'd like to recognize uh, one of my fellow school boards from another uh, division. We have uh, Mr. Mason, would you please stand? Dr. Mason, is, um, thank you for all you do in the school uh, in Hampton, and welcome to uh, our school board. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that being said, we do have some cards. And uh, first up, we have um, Dr. Wayne Smith. Would you please come forward? And as I see uh, in the fraternal way, the Divine Nine, he is uh, with Phi Beta Sigma. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, welcome to Thank Newport you. News. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, Chairman Hunter, Vice Chairman Brown, members of the school board, and good evening, Dr. Parker, Superintendent of Newport News Public Schools, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Wayne K. Smith, President of the Zeta Delta Sigma Chapter of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity was founded at Howard University in Washington, D.C., January 9, 1914 by three young African-American male students. The founder, the Honorable A. Langston Taylor, the Honorable Leonard F. Morris, and the Honorable Charles I. Brown wanted to organize a Greek letter fraternity that would truly exemplify the ideas of brotherhood, scholarship, and service. The fraternity's motto is culture for service and service for humanity. The three national programs are Bigger and Better Business, Education, and social action. Today, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated has blossomed into an international organization of leaders. Tonight's focus is on our educational program and support to the Newport News Public Schools. The Zeta Delta Sigma Chapters Educational Chair is Brother John Harris, who's with us tonight. The educational program develop on the fraternity's tradition, traditional emph emphasis on the education of academic achievement as an ingredient to success. The two components of the educational program is adopt the school and scholarship. The, uh, the adopt the school component is designed to get Sigma men into the schools. The Zeta Delta Sigma chapter has adopted Carver Elementary School. We are proud to say that under the, under the leadership of Izzy Brown principal. The chapter has donated children's books to Carver Elementary School to assist the reading program. Additionally, the chapter has adopted Denby High School's band program under the direction of Edgar Rawls III. The second component of the education program is scholarship. 
The Sigma Beta Club serves young male students between the ages of 8 and 18. The Sigma Beta Club students who remain consistent with attendance and participation until graduation from your high schools will receive a monetary scholarship. The Zeta Delta Sigma Chapter of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated fully support the Newport News Public School Board in meeting the educational goals of its students. And secondly, the Zeta Delta Sigma Chapter will provide input to the school board and the superintendent when community issues arise that may impact the educational process. Here tonight, joining me are the brothers of the Zeta Delta Sigma Alumni Chapter and brothers of the Beta Gamma Chapter undergrad of Hampton University. Please stand, brothers. Thank you so much. And if we can do anything for you, please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Smith. Next we have uh, Jermaine Knight. Please come forward. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I would like to thank you for allowing me to come before you today with my issue in hopes that it will be resolved. I deem it absolutely necessary to amend these two rules for the school dress code as follows. The prevention of wearing non-religious headwear or head coverings of any kind, hats, hoods, sweatbands, bandanas, etc., and the ban on tank tops, tube tops, halter tops, or shoulder tops. So what is the issue with such things? Is a hat disrespectful or shoulders unprofessional, something taboo or sexual? Not at all. If so, to whom? Many of the traditional and conservative administrators that I have personally spoke to are advocates for such rules, thinking that they are distractions and do not promote professionalism. But I find that younger teachers and students alike agree that this is unessential. Such things are even silly to be considered unprofessional or distracting. So is it because the older ones are wiser that, they, that their opinions varies? Not so, just stuck in tradition. Of course, a long time ago, it was deemed unprofessional for women to even wear pants. Surely if someone exposed their calves, they were a harlot. It is foolish and condescending to associate an article of clothing with a trait. We have progressed and we ask that the school does too. These are new times with new ideals, new people. And it is your duty as the school board to ensure that the rules and regulations be adjusted accordingly so that each group be taught in an environment that reflects their culture. If we remain complacent, we die. If any institution had remained as it was when it was first created, it undoubtedly failed. Progression is key, advancement is our mission. So how is it that hats, shirts that expose the shoulders have any significance? Isn't that a minute thing? Yes, it is insignificant. And if that is so, aren't the rules in place to prevent them irrelevant too? Headband, no headband, it makes no difference. With that in mind, it is imperative to remove that old tradition that supposedly advocates for excellence and decorum. A snake must shed, a bird must molt, to bring new life. It is in fact a minute thing, but a single step in the right direction is the only thing that can bring forth the light of the hope for a better future. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Of course, there are other insignificant rules and customs that the school has, but if I try to present them all at this moment, it would be overwhelming. So I start here. We must do away with all trifles, one by one. A small step, all part of a bigger plan. I request that the school board help me this day so that we begin to shed the old, tattered rags of our predecessors and step into the new clothes of progression. Just a small change to make way for a revived institution. All things need improvement and amending constantly. If we get rid of the fluff, we can zero in on the bigger issues. Our teachers have more concern than a student's apparel. The security guards are overwhelmed with all the useless regulations they must enforce. It's a waste of energy to enforce these rules, waste of time we could use for a greater. Now, I'm, try I'm not trying to rid the dress code completely. It is honorable and important for structure. But if we can free some of the load, why shouldn't we? The insignificant takes a toll and comes with a price. Amending is imperative in the name of progression. To turn a blind eye from this is nothing short of negligence. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Knight. Ms. Brianna Powell.
Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Parker, and members of the board. My name is Brianna Powell, and I go to Minshall High School, and I am a senior. Take a look around this room. We would not be here today if it not had been for the world changer, Maria Jones. Last year, Maria, working with the Newport News Public Schools Youth Development Department, designed and co-founded Bloom. Maria often led the planning meetings with students, staff, and the community to organize the first Bloom Conference. After the conference, Maria helped to implement Bloom Clubs in each of the middle schools and continues to serve Bloom as an empowerment coach, which is our the yellow shirts. In addition to Bloom, Maria founded an organization to help showcase local talent called 757 Underground, which promotes the arts among youth and provides them with a safe space to exhibit their talent and connect to the community. Described by one teacher as a rock star, Maria is also founding member of the Newport News Citywide Student Council Association Executive Board, which she helped to launch in 2016. She has also served the city as a member of the Mayor's Youth Commission for the past two years. And last year, Mayor Maria was able to serve as a student representative to the Newport News Public Schools School Board, the highest student leadership position in the school division. A talented performer, Maria is also a member of the Woodside High School's Jubilee Choral and Chamber Orchestra. Recently, Maria participated in the Virginia Teen Miss Pageant and qualified to compete at the national pageant level. In addition to leading and representing students and excellence in academics, Maria still manages to work a part-time job. She is fearless and committed student leader who who helps to drive positive culture across the Newport News Public Schools and the school division. So to my friend and one of my closest people, it is with great pride that we and Bloom and Ms. Adams recognize world changer Maria Jones. Thank you very much. And Ms. Jones, uh, thank you for all that you do for your fellow students and for the Newport News Public Schools. We really appreciate that. And, uh, it's, it's something I love, so it doesn't even feel like I'm doing that much. <laughs> Next we have uh, uh, Rhonda Wagner. Please come forward. Good evening, I'm back again. This time, not for a request, but just to deliver something. Um, last month you did approve uh, the, donating, uh, the plane donation, and the aviation students have taken time to th write all of you thank you cards, because they do very much appreciate it. My son is an aviation student, so if he would please kindly go over there to Miss Hinton and give her the cards. Thank you for working on his social skills. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Do we have any more cards? Uh, there being no other cards, uh, again, I want to thank all those who came forward uh, this evening. Uh, we'll move the agenda to items number three, our consent agenda, 3.01, the minutes and uh, from the board retreat, October 5, 2018, minutes from the work session, October 16, 2018, 3.03 .03, minutes from special meeting October 16, 2018. 3.04 minutes from our regular session uh, October 16, 2018. Uh, 3.05 our financial reports, child nutrition services October 2018, revenue and expenses October 2018. And last but not least, I believe we have a 3.06 our personnel report. Uh, can I get a motion for approval of the consent agenda? So moved. Second. You heard the motion, you heard the second. Time for the question. Is there any question? There being none, Ms. Hinton, please call a roll. 
Mr. Hunter? Four. Ms. Simons? Four. Ms. Sewell's Law? Four. Dr. Best? Four. Mr. Brown? Four. Mr. Ely? Four. Motion carries 6 0. And uh, thank you very much. And at this time, I'm going to pass uh, the microphone over to uh, our superintendent, uh, Dr. Parker. For thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is my uh, pleasure to announce two principals who will be uh, joining uh, their prospective schools in the very near future. I'd like to start by introducing Dr. Uh, Wendy Nichols, the new principal at Woodside High School. Mm -hmm. Wendy is, Dr. Nichols is a familiar face, having served uh, three years, um, currently in her third year, as principal of Gildersleeve Middle School in Newport News. Uh, prior to joining the staff at Gildersleeve, uh, Wendy served two years as principal of Dutch Row Elementary, uh, elementary school and a combined 18 years as either a teacher, reading specialist, instructional supervisor, or principal in Newport News Public Schools. Uh, Dr. Nichols is a solid instructional leader who understands the importance that Newport News Public Schools plays in the community. Um, she has, uh, as an educator, she's a resident and also a parent in our community. Uh, she is joined this evening by someone you, you may know fairly well our chief academic officer and supportive husband, Mr. Brian Nichols, and family, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> and Wendy, congratulations again. And if you have any, any uh, remarks, you're welcome to do so at this time. Oh, All right, and we look forward to your service and, and your leadership. Thank you very much. Uh, I am also pleased uh, to uh, introduce Dr. Kelly Mason, the new principal at Warwick High School. <laughs> Dr. Mason is currently serving as principal of Lynn Haven Middle School in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Uh, prior to, to that assignment, Dr. Mason served a combined total of 25 years in Virginia Beach as a social studies teacher, instructional specialist, assistant principal, and principal. Uh, while serving in central office, Dr. Mason was responsible for the training and sustainability of the Advanced De Via Individual Determination, or AVID, College Readiness Program throughout the city. In that capacity, she impacted the lives of hundreds of first-generation college students. Kelly is joined by her supportive husband, Dr. Richard Mason, uh, who is a school board member for Hampton City Public Schools. Dr. Mason, also congrat uh, congratulations and welcome, and thank you for being here. And uh, Dr. Mason, if you have any comments, we'd like to. Just to say thank you for this opportunity. I'm excited about being back on the peninsula. <laughs> I spent all my time in Virginia Beach, and I'm just looking forward to being there. So thank you so much. Thank you, and welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Parker, and again, congratulations to those two new appointments. Uh, as I've, as we were heard, as we heard in our closed session that these two individuals are, are dynamic and we're looking to look for great things from both of you. Again, thank you and thank for all your family members who uh, came out tonight to support you. So again, uh, another round of applause for those appointments. Okay, um, we'll move the agenda to number four. There's, uh, I believe, no action items. Is that correct? Yes, sir. There being none, we're going to Proceed on to our reports and information, 5.01. Uh, we'll have Mr. Pat, Pat, Pat Finneran come forward. He's going to present to us a detailed position of statements and on some key K-12 education issues uh, that we may or will be devoted on in uh, next year, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, thank you, Mr. Hunter, and good evening to you and to uh, Vice Chairman Brown. Uh, Dr. Parker, Superintendent, and members of the board and our audience. Um, it's that time of year again uh, for take a look at the upcoming General Assembly session and issues of importance to the school board and education in general. And these are presented um, in the, your legislative program as a draft program that was posted, I believe, last week for your review. Um, and it's the board's opportunity really to convey not all the issues but some of the key uh, issues that will be um, discussed in the, in, in the upcoming session. And this is, again, is a draft for your review. And during the course of the session, of course, for those who haven't been here before, uh, we'll be uh, updating you. There will be hundreds of education bills introduced, but we'll be updating you uh, through written reports as that goes on. So let's 
go to the next one. Can I do this here? Yeah. Um, just to take, take a look at some of the dates of interest just to get started. The session actually starts on January 9th. It's always the second Wednesday of, of uh, January. It's a short session, 45 days. Uh, so by February 23rd, the session will actually be over. Um, but the veto session, and this is important, will actually not take place until April 3rd. That's when everything is actually finalized. And of course, that's after you have approved your budget. So that's always of interest um, because you have to approve the budget be before you actually know uh, for, for good what your uh, financial uh, uh, condition will be. Other dates of interest is just a couple. Two days from now, the VSBA delegate assembly uh, will be taking place, and I'll mention that a little bit later. And November 28th, uh, which Michelle mentioned earlier, is the Take Your Legislator to School Day. And there's a few other up there uh, of interest, especially the governor's budget proposal. On December 17th, we'll see what the governor's proposing uh, for education and all other uh, organizations in the state. Um, our next slide will take us to some of our priority positions. And in the program that you have, the written program, you'll see that we actually start um, with thanks to our legislators, and I want to say that, uh, for increasing funding for K-12 education in the 2018 session. Uh, they added about $600 million more dollars mm -hmm. to K-12 education over the biennium. That's over two years. Um, and so we want to say thank you for uh, making that a priority. But you'll also see that we're asking for more funding in 2019 uh, for school facilities, school safety and security, and for teachers. And you might ask why, uh, because $600 million over by any seems like a lot of money, and it is. Uh, but the answer is, on, is in the chart on your screen. Uh, you'll see that this is really not a mission accomplished um, moment for the state. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Even after this session, K-12 education uh, funding has not return to the pre-recession levels uh, when you count inflation. And just to take a look at, to make it down to, down to level, uh, Newport News Public Schools actually, when you account for inflation, receives $833 less per student than it did uh, pre-recession, -pre 2009. And so another major loss, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we, we keep this on the front burner and we try to get back to our pre-recession levels and above, of course. So another, um, one of the major losses that we saw during that 10-year uh, period or so was capital improvement funding from the state. Mm -hmm. um, we'd like to ask, this, this legislative program asked the school uh, state to restore some of the school construction funding. We used to get about $1.2 million in uh, actually school construction grants annually. Mm -hmm. um, that went away. The state literary, literary fund loan has not added projects for several years. And we've been told that some of the new lot, well, it's not new, but some of the lottery money that's been allocated for school construction is flexible enough to use, but it's also competing with many, many, many other, um, uh, other items that are needed, such as salaries, uh, Virginia retirement payments, and, and, and about a dozen other things that are in there. Um, and we all know that school conditions do impact student achievement. Um, studies you know, in many areas of the, um, the country have shown that when a school is, is bright, clean, modern, has great facilities, and meets the new learning styles of collaboration and teamwork, um, uh, scores go up. So what are we going to do about that? And this is a, a prime position this year because the state right now has a golden opportunity to make a big impact. Um, in July, I believe it was of this year, um, a, a ruling, a Supreme Court ruling called South Dakota versus Wayfair, and you may have ordered some things from Wayfair online, um, said that states can, in fact, require companies like Wayfair and others to collect sales tax on their sales, even if they're not located in the, in the state. Yeah. This means that the state, Virginia, could collect upwards of 200 to 300 million dollars from internet sales annually, and take that and leverage it into new revenue through bonds, uh, potentially upwards of a billion dollars for school construction projects. Um, and as you look at it, this new funding could be used for either current projects that are coming on, that we're, or future projects that are coming on, or if we've already done or other schools or divisions have already done uh, projects for CIP uh, to, to, to use it to um, 
payoffs or CIP that they've already that they've already incurred. So we think now is the time. Um, just point to that one statement at the bottom. It says if lawmakers take the right action, the state could have finally have the revenues to make these vital investments. And we think it's very important just to make sure our legislators know that they are vital investments and that we need them. Moving along, um, next priority position is school safety and security. And we're very, very fortunate that the state has had two major committees looking at this, a select committee um, from the General Assembly and the Governor's Children's Cabinet. They both come up with dozens and dozens, I think it's about 70 uh, recommendations. Uh, the final report from the House Select, select Committee will be done in uh, December 15th. Um, and because there are so many positions, we haven't actually, uh, potential legislative um, action, we haven't actually uh, taken a position on any of them that we think are going to be there. We just set some parameters there. And I'd like to just draw your attention to the first one and just say that any legislation occurring should uh, really effectively and efficiently address issues through multiple strategies, including school, school support, some facility design, personnel technology. And then the bottom one, let's not have it create an unfunded mandate, uh, as so often happens with some of our legislation. Um, next priority uh, that you have is teacher recruitment, retention, and pay. Uh, that is really a, an issue that we looked at every year. Um, this is not a budget year. We don't expect to see another budget um, for uh, teacher increases. But we'd like to ask the General Assembly to make good on its promise. You see it down at the bottom uh, bullet. In 2017, they set 138 out of 140 legislators. One was absent and one, uh, I think, abstained, um, said that their goal was to pay teachers at or above the national average. Uh, so we'd like to ask them to start planning for that uh, this year. And secondly, um, teacher recruitment, um, we want to recruit teachers, but we also want to retain them. And um, another thing that they could do, legislators could do, is uh, create some more programs or add to some more programs that help do that. You'll see on the left-hand side of the slide that teacher um, enrollment, that enrollment in teacher programs has dropped by over 200,000 people. Uh, in, in the, just a few years. Uh, so we need to expand the pipeline and try to do that by incre increasing uh, flexibility and licensure, providing more, more support for coaching, mentoring, uh, professional development, and something that we do very well in Newport News, uh, teacher residency programs. Uh, finally, the VSBA Delegate Assembly, is, again, is coming up in two days. Um, your school board representatives for that are Ms. Simons, who is the delegate, and uh, Mr. Hunter, who is the um, alternate, in case Ms. Simons cannot fulfill her duties. <laughs> uh, so uh, you've uh, been provided with the, um, well, about a 100-page document on that. And that boils down to really about seven new positions. I've looked at all of them. Um, I talked with Ms. Simons briefly about them. They've all been approved by the VSBA board unanimously, and I think that uh, they're all good to go in terms of voting on them on Thursday. Uh, but if you do have any questions, I'd be you know, happy to answer something about them. Uh, the only one I would say is that there's a, uh, there's a requirement in there that would, uh, a position in there that would require testing for color blindness. And if we could just ask the General Assembly if there's a cost of that that we provide um, if they provide some funding for that, that would be good. So that's really it for the uh, legislative update. Um, next steps are to monitor the issues, provide legislators with a draft copy. Of course, we'll see them on the 28th. Um, this will be an action item at the board meeting. And during the session, I'll be up there to support um, your, your priorities. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. Uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> well, your, uh, your draft legislation uh, uh, memo notes a 2015 uh, Rutgers Graduate School of Education study uh, comparing teacher salaries uh, to non-teacher positions. And I'd just be very interested to have a, a copy of that study. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, yes, Ms. Jones. 
Um, so I just have one question. Yes. Has there been any thought on using possibly student voice in an effort to get the legislators to kind of look at, um, to kind of push the issues that um, we're currently, you know, hoping we're going to gunning for. I know one mm -hmm. thing that I've really learned um, as far as my kind of starting a career in political advocacy mm -hmm. and things is that their capital, like the legislators, and they're really starting to take a new look on youth voice. So that might be something positive mm -hmm. that could maybe get legislation that is favorable to us pushed if we found a way to incorporate student voice and, you know, tell the legislators, hey, it's not just the school teachers and school mm -hmm. board members that want this, it's the students that need it as well, if they're saying it. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a fantastic idea, and I'd be happy to work with you or other students uh, during the session. And uh, they did actually have an opportunity, they've come into a couple um, schools over the uh, summer and fall and actually talked with teachers about school safety in particular and so I'd love to continue that and if, if we can talk more about that so thank you anyone else I have a question oh yes, yes. Um, yes. what could you, could you share what are the legislators that are against taxing internet sales like could you just share what are a couple of their arguments <laughs> I'm just curious. Yeah, well, we haven't heard that anybody's against that. No one has come out that I've heard other than that there's a caution about raising taxes in general. There's also one um, issue that we did hear that I think we've addressed in our, in our legislative program is that if you tax the internet um, and provide money for schools to build, to build new schools, what how will we, we be fair to schools that have <coughs> school divisions that have already built their schools and don't need any more money? And um, actually, I don't think that's a, that's actually a, a case in in Virginia, but I think uh, this position says the money should go for either new construction or to pay down the debt on old construction. That was one of the main uh, criticisms of the idea that I heard. Were there any? Just clar clarify, were there any concerns with that money going somewhere else? Yes, there, there is. The, um, actually, the, the money, um, there was a bill that was passed maybe a couple years ago that said if Congress authorized internet sales tax, the money would go to transportation in Virginia. Um, there is a small loophole in this that will allow it to go to education or something else in that Congress did not pass this, this any legislation to do this. This was a Supreme Court decision. So Congress, in all fairness, did not pass anything uh, that would require it to go to uh, transportation. So we think there's a legitimate re you know, uh, um, call to have some of this money go to education. I think, does that help at all? Mr. Jones? Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any other possible sources of revenue that could be used towards education that are on the table? Well, the lottery funding actually has gone up. Now, that will be, you know, uh, usually go to our operations, of course, or could, but if it goes up enough, it could be used for uh, more school construction as well. Uh, again, the lottery is, has um, a, a role in funding many, many, many things, such as t textbooks um, and about a dozen other uh, things. But if the lottery does go up, that, that could help. We also had a major announcement today um, that Amazon is coming to uh, our state. Mm -hmm. um, that may have a, a big economic impact. That will take a while, though. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a, a, a bright spot in terms of economics in, in the future. So, Any other questions? Mr. Finneran, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thanks. Uh, we'll, we'll move the agenda, um, item number 5.02. Uh, I guess we'll have Ms. Nancy Sweat to come up. Uh, each year, the secondary teachers, schools, and supervisors are given the opportunity to suggest new courses, suggest revisions to the existing courses, or recommend eliminating the existing courses offerings. A committee is made up of both central office personnel, school-based administrators, review the request, and make recommendations to the superintendent. And so you will give us that report today. Absolutely. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Hunter, Dr. Parker, and members of the board. It is my privilege to bring to you a new course proposal for school year 2019-20. The new course proposal that I'm bringing to you um, is brought to you every fall. And um, this year we are proposing one new science course, a science elective specifically for ninth graders. 
So just to remind you and share with you, every time we propose a course, all courses and proposals are examined with an eye toward the Virginia Standards of Learning and also the college career and citizen ready skills which are ingrained in everything we do in Newport News. Um, specific, as a, uh, specific CCC skills that will be in tonight's proposal include um, critical thinking, problem solving, and social responsibility, all embedded into the science standards that you will see in tonight's course proposal. We have a process, of course, for going through new course proposals. It began in September 20, on September 20th, where we shared um, and disseminated the application process to all teachers and administrators. Then on October 22nd was the deadline for submitting that application. And then we met the committee, which is the Curriculum Advisory Committee made up of central office staff, administrators, and our instructional supervisors of our content areas, we met on October 25th to review, hear presentations, and rule on which proposals we would bring to you tonight. So the new course we are proposing is environmental science specifically for ninth grade. This environmental science class is a VDOE approved course. It will count as an earth science elective and it includes pretty much a semester of earth science concepts and a semester of biology concepts. It's ideal and a great way to introduce and backfill and firm up science from middle school and it allows a pathway to go into other sciences that we offer at the high school. It's also a way of making sure that we can introduce and, and firm up those standards before we get to a verified credit and an SOL test in high school. Um, our HR department is of course very pleased because we are allowed to use endorsements with either a biology endorsement or a health sci or a, um, earth science endorsement. So we do not fear anything with staffing for teaching this class in ninth grade. Just to give you a sample of the pathway that the students could take if they choose to take earth, environmental science as ninth graders, they could then go into earth science or biology, thereby getting their verified credit through an SOL test. After that, they could go into biology if they went into earth science, or they could go into chemistry. We also have a rich array of about eight exactly eight um, biology electives that they could go into um, after that. And then as a senior, they could go further into a biology study or they could return to those concepts of environmental science and take AP environmental science as a senior. So that's just a sample pathway. There are other options, but I wanted to provide for you a sequence. Uh, but we have so many rich offerings in our science department that this is just one possible pathway. So what is our implementation plan? It really falls into three steps. Tonight, of course, I'm requesting your um, consideration for approval next month. After that, our students would be in course selection and registration next February, um, where they would choose their courses, and then we would know the need for this class. And then after that, beyond that, it would be spring and taking us into summer, where we would build out the curriculum based on the VDOE standards that have been provided. We would do professional development for the teachers who have been identified to teach this course, and then we would also do the um, materials. So that is the proposal for tonight. Okay. Any questions? No. Uh, yes, Ms. Jones. Um, so I know now AP Environmental Science is currently offered at the ninth grade level. So I've kind of yes. got a couple of questions about that. So sure. will it then be moved to be offered specifically at the senior level? Is it still open? It was. It is absolutely still open. Okay. It's, this class is really probably for students who need more science time after their middle school experience, where obviously if you're going into AP science, you are pretty confident in science. This is a class that can help with that. So no, this doesn't interfere with AP environmental science at all, which is already available 9th through 12th. Now, are the curriculum similar? So a lot of times, um, I know when students will opt in to take an AP class in a given subject and say that 
the AP is too stressful or too rigorous, yes. then we'll just go to the honors level. So is, it, is the curriculum going to match up so that students can do that? Um, the curriculum doesn't match up that tightly um, because it is more of an introductory class for those concepts that you will see in AP environmental, where I, AP environmental is intended to be quite rigorous. Okay, so would it be, yes. one more question last Absolutely. Time. Would it be offered at just the um, regular course level or as an honors class as Only well? Only offered as a regular. Okay. Yes, because cool. we are keeping this just for ninth grade and it is really just offered for students. We would work uh, pretty closely with the counselors to find out what profile of a student really needs this extra year before they go into that verified. Awesome. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, uh, Dr. Best. Will this course be offered to all students to include Achievable Dream? I know sometimes they're a little different, but will it be offered to all ninth graders? Yes, we are putting it in the book for all ninth graders, and then of course we have to go through the same process of how many students are registered for the class, if the class can make for us. But it is absolutely something that can be offered at Achievable Dream, because I would go back to the idea that the endorsement is Earth Science and Biology, and those are staffed at Achievable Dream as well. Any other questions? Um, Mr. Brown. Yes. And just given that students have the ability to take earth science or biology in the ninth grade, now what was some of the thinking behind when you looked at some of the results for, for those ninth grade students offering earth environmental science prior to them moving into earth science or biology? Yes. So we have in middle school, we have about, um, about 700 students who um, were worried about their performance in eighth grade in eighth grade science. And of course, we're working on that in our middle school. But we're thinking there is a good reason to have an other opportunity for them to firm up those science skills before getting into biology or earth science, which would create more success for those classes. So this isn't a pathway for all students, but it is an option because in Newport News, of course, we like to have opportunities for all of our students. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Ms. Zero Swartz. So one question that I know will come later yes. uh, will be, can it be offered for eighth grade students? Will it be something that would end up being an opportunity for middle school? We could probably, we will certainly consider that in the future. I think we want to try it right now with mm -hmm. ninth grade. We run into a little bit of um, endorsement issue because our middle school students, our middle school teachers rather, are usually endorsed in physical science, mm -hmm. not in biology or in earth science. We usually find that student, that mm -hmm. teacher at the high school. But that could be, that could be addressed. We would just need some time to build that. Um, yes, Ms. Yeah, um, thank you so much Absolutely. for this presentation. Um, I just want to remind everyone uh, watching that this is the hard work that we, we do in administration, that we don't get some <laughs> curriculum for free from the state, that we actually have to develop the professional develop, the curriculum development, the material procurement, and it, it's a lot of hard work to make sure we're offering the right courses to our students. So thank you so much for, appreciate for that. doing thank that you. hard work. Anyone else? Uh, thank you, Ms. Way. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to uh, item number 5.03, our gift service, service program. program. We'll have Ms. Uh, Becker Dyke, is that correct? And she is going to uh, give us a report on the programs and services for the education of our gifted students. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Hunter, Chandler, and Hunter. I'm sorry. Good evening, Dr. Parker, Chairman Hunter, and Vice Chairman Brown. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you this evening about the Gifted Services Program. I look forward to sharing with you the wonderful things that we have going on in Newport News Public Schools. Tonight's presentation will take you through a journey of gifted services. We are guided by the regulations governing the educational services for our gifted students and it will take you through our professional development opportunities, not only for our gifted teachers, but also available for all Newport News Public School staff. We will talk about the mission for the Gifted Services Program, as well as our gifted identification process. And I will also talk with you about our enrollment trends and our equitable representation of our student populations in Newport News Public Schools. So who is a gifted learner? There is not one specific definition of a gifted child, and that's what makes my job so much fun because I get to work with so many different types of gifted learners. And so when I go out into our classrooms, I see students who have vivid imaginations. They may, may, they may be more comfortable with adults 
than they may be with their own peers. They are going to be curious. They're going to have questions. They are going to be out of the box thinkers. They are going to be the ones that like to take things apart and to put things back together and they may still have pieces left over. They're going to have intense interest. They're going to have more academic abilities and maybe a little bit socially awkward. And they're going to have excellent critical thinking and problem solving skills. And our gifted students come from all sorts of populations. So we're going to have English language learners, and we're going to have students who may also receive special education services, as well as gifted services. And those are twice exceptional students. So within the gifted services program, our mission is to make sure that we challenge our students so that they are reaching their maximum potential academically, socially, and emotionally. And we differentiate our instruction as we teach accelerated and advanced content and skills. So how do we do this? We make sure that we foster our academic and our intellectual growth of our students, kindergarten through 12th grade. And we do this by making sure that we have our in-depth learning of all core subjects through creativity, analytical thinking, abstract ideas, and real world problem solving. We are guided by the regulations governing the educational services for gifted students, which is set forth by the Virginia Department of Education. And this document guides our local plan for the gifted, which is the five-year plan that we created here in Newport News Public Schools. And it was a collaboration of teachers, the gifted services department, administrators, and parents. And through this, Newport News Public Schools make sure that we are in compliance through our program model and the curriculum that we provide, our definition of giftedness for our students, our professional development opportunities, not only for our gifted teachers, but for New Bernese public school staff, as well as our equi equitable <coughs> representation of our students in our programs. So now I would like to take you through a journey of what our program model looks like here in Newport News, because it is unique to Newport News public schools. We have a community gifted site model. And why do we have that? Because we listened to our parents who told us that they wanted to make sure that their students could receive gifted services at their home school. And they did not want to have to leave. And so for our kindergarten through second grade students, they receive pullout services at all of our elementary schools. And with our pullout services, they can receive that. At, at, through their enrichment block, and they have creativity in problem solving, analytical thinking, STEM services. We work with math and literature. And that is really the basis of the primary gifted program, which then builds going into our third through fifth grade program, which is still a community gifted site model. And we offer that at 16 elementary schools. Mm -hmm. While we only offer it at 16 elementary schools, all of our second grade students are tested and they have the opportunity to go to those sites. And that second, that kindergarten through second grade program then builds going into our third through fifth grade program. So it's a wonderful transition. <coughs> and at that, those 16 elementary sites, we then work with those advanced curriculum and we build upon our already fabulous Newport News Public Schools curriculum, and we augment it with junior grade books, hands-on equations, Renzulli online learning, and our William and Mary language arts curriculum. And then we transition into our middle school gifted program, where we have five fabulous sites at An Achievable Dream, Heinz, Dozier, Gildersleeve, and Huntington at Heritage, where we work with advanced curriculum and all of the core subjects science, social studies, math, and English. Then at the secondary level, we are meeting the requirements through dual language, honors, and advanced placement. We have 28 advanced placement courses available to our students at the secondary level. In addition, we have the IB program available at Warwick High School for international baccalaureate. And then our students as juniors and seniors can participate in the Governor's School for Science and Technology, where students can take three rigorous strands, such as biological science, computational science, and engineering. Yet we believe that students need to go beyond the academics, take them out of the classroom, and, be, and go into college career in citizen ready. And two such programs are Odyssey of the Mind and Robotics. And this is going to allow the students to be collaborators, innovators, spontaneous thinkers, 
and problem solvers. And this is how we're going to prepare students because they are going to be able to solve problems and solutions. And these programs are available for elementary, middle, and high school students. In addition, we allow our students the opportunity to participate in the Scripps Spelling Bee in middle school, as well as the Summer Residential Governor School for our high school students. Now, I've already talked with you about our identification process of the characteristics of our students. Now, how do we train our teachers in order to do that? That's through our professional development opportunities. We have University of Employment Development sessions on our gifted competencies. And the gifted competencies are set forth by the Virginia Department of Education. And those are on gifted characteristics of our learners, social emotional needs of gifted students, curriculum, content, differentiation, and twice exceptional learners. In addition, we provide specific content for our teachers on hands-on equations, as well as William and Mary language arts curriculum, Renzulli, and other, complete, uh, other content level courses. We also have a cohort partnership with William and Mary for offering endorsement courses in gifted education. And this is a partnership set forth by Human Resources because they have your March money to pay for the tuition for our teachers to participate in the college level courses. In addition, our teachers are also participating in online courses to earn their endorsements in gifted education. In addition, we also provide opportunities for our staff members at the school levels to learn about identification and referral procedures. How do you refer a student for gifted education and who can do that? A student, a parent, an administrator, a librarian, and a school counselor. All students can be referred for gifted education and we also district-wide refer students for second and fifth grade. So now I would like to take you through a journey. Just this morning, I received a call. We have a new student who just arrived into Newport News Public Schools. And this student was referred by a teacher who attended one of my UA courses this past summer. And she called me and she said, Dr. Beckerdade, I just remembered your characteristics training. And I believe that this student should be referred for testing. And I said, well, give me that child's name. So I started the referral process. What we did, we sent home the parent permission to test form. And with that, we also sent home the parent evaluation of gifted characteristics. With that, on that form is a form that lists, does your child have abstract thinking? Does your child have a large vocabulary? Any advanced ideas? Problem solving skills. And from there, we also sent home a teacher evaluation similar questions. And then we find out about the report card, grades, and class work. Next, we set up testing for that child. And then we take all of that information, once we, uh, once we have all of that information, the gifted screening committee meets. And then once that gifted screening committee meets to determine eligibility, we send home the information for the results. We use a variety of measures to determine the testing the Naglieri Nonverbal Ability Test, as well as the Otis Lennon School Ability Test. Excuse me, just thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Thank you so much. Now I can continue. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> mm, sorry. The Naglieri non, Nonverbal Ability Test, as well as the Otis Lennon School Ability Test. And this. Stand for, I'm sorry, and the screening assessment for gifted elementary school students are the aptitude tests that we administer. Those aptitude tests measure problem solving and general reasonability for our students. We also administer for our second through our 12th grade students achievement tests, the Iowa Test of Basic Skills, as well as the Otis Linden, I'm sorry, as well as the Stanford. All of those together 
we will review as part of the gifted screening committee and then we will send the results to the parents. In addition to the results that we send home to the parents, we also send newsletters and information. If they are the third grade student, we will send open house information because we realize that is such a transition, especially if the parent and the student are changing schools. Now, once we send that information, the work within the gifted department begins because we begin tracking the enrollment data. And here you can see the enrollment data for gifted services. And I have shown schools year schools year 16, 17, 17, 18, and 18, 19. And we show approximately 11% of the students in Newport News public schools are identified as gifted. And that is on average the amount of students across the nation. So we are doing very well within the gifted program here in Newport News. And uh, we have approximately 2,760 students identified right now in Newport News. And it is important to know that this chart shows first grade through 12th grade. Our kindergarten students are not listed because we identify our kindergarten students in the spring. However, one of the goals in Newport News is to make sure that we have equitable representation. So the next piece is going to show the, the piece because we want to make sure that our gifted program is as diverse as our population in Newport News Public Schools. And I think you will see that we are leading the charge in Newport News Public Schools because we are ahead of the game in terms of minority representation and we are ahead of the state and the national average because currently we have 55% minority students in our program in Newport News Public Schools. And I'd like to tell you how we did that. We began the equity initiative back in 2011 and 2012. After a review of data for three years, we realized that we had schools that were not referring students from underserved populations. And we realized that we needed to have a culture change. We needed to do staff development training with our schools based on gifted characteristics. And we had to talk with them so that they could understand how to refer students. And then we went in and we modeled lessons. Part of the gifted resource team and myself, we went in and we modeled lessons with the students and with the teachers. The teachers would observe the gifted resource teachers teaching so that they could see the higher order thinking skills that the students were eliciting and so that they could say, oh, I think these students should be referred. And then we also conducted creativity lessons with the students. And out of that, you will see our success stories, Rich Neck Elementary School and Achievable Dream Academy. Out of that, Rich Neck Elementary School started referring students as early as 2013-14. And they built their primary gifted program in the K-12 program, and our K-2 program. And from the K-2 program primary gifted, we were able to start a site for 3-5 in the gifted elementary program that then doubled the program going into Dozier Middle School. And so not only have we seen the elementary program grow, we've also seen the middle school program grow. An achievable dream. When we first started out of achievable dream, we had less than 10 students referred for gifted screening. We worked very hard to make sure that we were referring students and then we were able to grow the program at the K-2 level, and then we were able to grow the program at the 3-5 level, starting with the gifted program there. Not only have we grown a gifted program at the 3-5 level, we have now expanded into the middle school level. And I'm happy to say now these students are going into the high school. So those are our success stories, to make sure that we have a true equitable representation in our gifted program. So we did not do this alone. It is a true parent, school, and community involvement effort. Through ongoing communication, community events, programs for our gifted students, informational meetings, and gifted open houses. We make sure that we are bringing in our community partners, providing options for our parents on social emotional needs of gifted learners. How can they provide opportunities for our students especially with summer enrichment programs to keep them involved and making sure that we are 
showing that we are listening to our parents. So our next steps, continue to solicit feedback from our stakeholders, continue our ongoing parent and community involvement, and make sure that we are continuing our pro professional development options because we realize that we need certified teachers and we realize that we need to, more people to be trained in gifted education. That is the only way that we are going to make sure that we continue to grow the gifted program. And we need to continue to work with human resources to rec recruit teachers with endorsements in gifted education. I'll be happy to take questions now. Okay, any questions? Ms. Jones. Um, so I just, amazing presentation by the way, it was Thank awesome, you. really informative. Um, I just have one question, so is behavior a factor in considering eligibility for gifted students? You know, that is a very good question. Because one of the things that I share when I do my social emotional needs of gifted learners, I talk about psychomotor tendencies. And that is something that they talk about because psychomotor tendencies, that is a behavior. And it talks about how that can be considered ADD versus and they need lots of movement they're getting up and that's part of what people consider that can be a negative but with training we can say that it's not necessarily a negative that they need movement that's a characteristic of somebody who is gifted that it can be considered that and somebody needs to get up and they need to move and that they are always talking no it's not a negative that it is a characteristic of their giftedness. And that's why it's so important for people to be trained to recognize that it's a positive and that it's a characteristic of giftedness. And so is behavior an issue? Not with training. And to be able to, to see that some of those characteristics are not really a negative, it's a positive, And it's a part of that child. And if we can take it and turn it into a positive and really streamline it, I think it's a positive thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Simons. Um, do we still use the Iowa um, at student achievement test for elementary students? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and everybody in every school does takes the Iowa? We use that for second through 12th grade. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay as part of the achievement test. Okay. Dr. Bess? Could you tell me a little bit about students that may not have been identified until middle or high school? Can you share a little bit about that? Yes, ma'am. So we implemented the fifth grade testing because we were recognizing the fact that some students were not being identified until middle school. And having been a middle school teacher, I was drawing on my own background, and I realized that I was having students come into my classroom that I knew were gifted, but I recognized that they were not being identified. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that I did when I came to this position, I did a little focus group, and I said, do you think that this would be a good idea? Because I wanted to make sure that we were trying to capture those students beforehand. And so I think that that's a positive piece. Do I think that we should try and capture students beforehand, absolutely, and we do referrals at the third grade level and the fourth grade level beforehand. It is a little bit harder for students going into the middle school level, but I think it is a positive transition year anyway, going in because it's uh, the students are able to go in at the feeder schools, but I know that when we try and have the students to go into the middle school, we certainly try to make sure that they are working up to that potential and then if we have students who maybe need a little extra work we try to make sure that we're working with the students does that answer your question um, yeah. okay. Okay. Uh, mr brown yes so i have uh, several questions um yes. so i, I noticed um that there is a requirement by the virginia department of education for the program for having a plan i'm sorry yes. for having a plan um i my understand i've heard from other uh, heard that other school divisions don't necessarily have um, well there are some school divisions that don't have a gifted program and so is it if you have it then you must have a plan but you can elect not to have a gifted program is that true is that true that is true okay um, and, and uh, 
I um, made note in, in 2012, thank you for the, this is a great report that in 2012, uh, there was a lot of introspection done and a lot of um, great progress um, has been made. I believe that at that time there was a report on there wasn't a sufficient number of gifted certified teachers and how has that level risen since 2012? Where are we at now and how many you know, uh, students can we serve with the number of, of gifted teachers and how many more do we still need to um, develop? I will say that we are in need of gifted certified teachers and that is probably true across Virginia. I know that when I speak with my colleagues in other districts, that is something that it that we consistently talk about. Uh, I know that from listening with Mr. Fennerin's uh, report that the number of teachers out there coming out of the other colleges, that's something that we are in desperate need of. And I know that one thing that we are looking towards and what the Virginia Department of Education says is that even if we do not have endorsed teachers, our teachers need to be trained in the competencies. So that is one thing that the new Brittany Public Schools is doing, is that making sure that if our teachers do not have the endorsement, that they are trained in the competencies. And what I mean by that, that they have to have knowledge of gifted education characteristics, the social emotional needs of gifted learners, and the curriculum, and the assessment piece. And all of those I do cover in my University of Employment, Employee Development sessions that I offer. I typically do sessions in the summer, during the year, as well as with my brand new teachers. And so I, I make sure that I cover those. The Virginia Department of Education just submit or just uh, released brand new information about the competencies. I have meetings again this week. They will be submitted to my teachers. So I'll always make sure that they have information about the competencies. Okay. But yes, we need, need gifted yeah. <laughs> endorsed teachers. And I think Newport News Public Schools is making a concerted effort, especially with human resources paying half the cost of the tuition towards that and gifted services is actually purchasing the textbooks for that so we are trying to make it cost effective for our teachers to earn their endorsement and i'm curious as to because because on this slide we have um, 16 schools for elementary five schools middle school uh, at middle school level uh, and then of course there's a, a wide coverage at high school so um, i'd just be curious to know offline which elementary schools don't have the program which middle schools don't have it um, and then my uh, last question was just in relation to, so we made great progress in relation mm -hmm. to minority enrollment in the gifted program, but now um, how does income play into that? What is our ratio of kids on free and reduced lunch mm -hmm. in the gifted program versus um, not being on that? Uh, so I'd be interested to know uh, where we stack up in, in terms of uh, those kind of income levels. Okay. So. And Mrs. Jones. Get, get that information. Um, are you, are you done, yes. So actually my question is related to the minority piece of it. So. Yes. Early enrollment, but how do we ensure that they're staying enrolled in gifted programs, specifically the more rigorous ones, such as the Governor's STEM School and IB? Yes, and I think that is something that we are trying to make sure that they are staying enrolled. Uh, I know that I sit on the advisory council for the Governor's School for Science and Technology, and so that is something that we make sure that they are that is something that we're trying to make sure that they are staying enrolled, definitely. And uh, with the IB program, I work directly with Mr. Holler, who is the program coordinator of the IB program, so that's something that we are always making sure of. But uh, yes, I don't have those exact numbers right now, but I can certainly get back to the board. And Mr. Brown, I think you have another question. Well, we have one more question. Uh, so in, in, this is a, a question related to the, the screening process. Yes. So we have second and fifth grade. Uh, and then after that time, then there's referral. Yes. Is it, um, because we have constrained resources, are we using a, like a sampling without replacement type system where if you got tested in second grade, uh, but then didn't, you, if you didn't get tested in second grade, then uh, we're working towards uh, getting that population tested in third grade and then continuing to whittle down so that everybody gets a chance to take the test at least once uh, through, their middle, through their elementary school time period? Or how are, how are we managing that? Uh, no, sir. We do district-wide testing in second and fifth grade, and then it's just based on referral for third and fourth grade, uh, based on that piece. And that's based on the research, because research does say that we should not test students more than once in a year, and we need to give them time for growth 
for that piece of it. And so usually what we try and do is to give them a year in between the time that we have tested them with that piece of it. Okay. And so the, then every, everyone, so if I, if I come in, uh, in the third grade, if I come into the division, I would take, I would get the test at that time because everybody gets the test in second grade. In other words, all students get covered by the test. Yes. Now, if you are brand new to the system, you can certainly uh, request for a referral. So at any time, if you're brand new to the system. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you very much. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, we will move on to item 5.04, Newport News Fiber Optics Network. I think we'll have Mr. Uh, Chris Jenkins come up, and he's going to elaborate uh, about our fiber optics network that was installed in 2004, which provides 2,500 students and 51 schools and sites across our division, um, digital books, security services, and screening content. So, Mr. Jenkins, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, Mr. Hunter, Mr. Brown, Dr. Parker, members of the board. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of our uh, of fiber optic networking in general, tell you a little bit about the technology, um, and then I'm going to tell you about how we've used, uh, NNP, uh, NNPS has used fiber optic technology in our network, talk a little bit about the agreement we have with the city uh, for their use of our fiber, uh, talk about what our current unused capacity is, and I'm going to wrap it up by telling you what some of the potential future uses are for this technology. <clears throat> so it's exciting stuff. I so I brought props with me. Miss um, <laughs> Hinton has an actual <laughs> sample of the fiber optic cable that we're going to pass around. So as I'm talking to you about a strand of fiber optic cable, it's the very smallest piece in there. It's about the diameter of a human hair, just so you know exactly what we're talking about. Uh, the technology is not new. It's been, um, it was conceptualized back in the 1920s. They just didn't have the manufacturing techniques to actually make it. Um, and it uses uh, a tiny strand of glass that you're holding in your hands uh, to transmit and receive data at very high speeds. Um, I say it's not new, but it is, uh, it's continued to evolve. It was developed uh, in the 70s, and then it became widely available technology in the 80s and through the 90s and the early 2000s. It's just continued to increase, um, and the improvements allow higher capacity bandwidth, and they allow it to the, the network speed to uh, be higher and the distances to be greater. So I'm going to move on and tell you a little bit about our network. Um, so fiber optic technology and the cable that you have, that is, uh, when we talk about our network, that is the vehicle that our network runs on. Uh, just like Waterworks has infrastructure in the ground to carry water throughout the city, we have infrastructure in the ground, uh, a pipeline, so to speak, of fiber optic cables to, de to deliver data to our schools and to our offices. Um, it allows us to send and receive tens of billions of bits of data per second over a single hair-like strand of, of that cabling. Our network has three rings and they're redundant, so if uh, each building is connected to at least two rings, so if there's a cut on one of the rings, everybody still has a path to get back to our data centers, everybody still has a path to get back to the internet. Uh, we have about 75 miles of total of fiber optic cable running throughout the city. There's 960 of those individual strands. And um, as Mr. Mr. Hunter uh, told you in the beginning, it connects 51 of our schools and sites. A uh, little bit of background. It was installed in 2004 at a cost of $12.5 million. Uh, which is a huge price tag. And thanks to some legislation that was passed in the General Assembly in 2002, NNPS was able to, um, to take advantage and, in, and make this purchase without actually incurring any debt. So this legislation allowed us to spread the cost out over multiple um, budget years. So we spread it out, um, excuse me, we, um, we spread it out and made our final payment in 2015. Uh, the current market price uh, listed there, the current market value, $13.5 million res reflects about $544 per strand per mile. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about next is the real value of the fiber, because the market value is just 
um, is just what we paid for it in today's dollars. The real value comes in the benefits, what we've been able to do with it, uh, and how we've been able to take advantage of it. Um, so right now we do have connectivity for over 25,000 student computers, and the nice thing about the network is that it's scaled. So if we need to increase that number, um, the network will, is more than capable of, uh, of handling whatever we need. It's allowed us to provide fast and reliable access to a whole lot of educational online content, Google Classroom, Khan Academy, uh, Desire to Learn, um, and it's allowed us to do this. Uh, we, can, we can provide as much data as we want at no additional cost um, for the transport of the data. One of the biggest areas where you can assign a dollar value to it is that it's allowed us to save money in the, in the leased lines that we used to have for telephones, for example. Since we run our telephone system over the network, you no longer need an individual phone line for every phone in your building. So it's allowed us to save money there. And prior to the fiber optic network, we had dedicated leased circuits to each of our buildings. Um, so when we're calculating what, what our total savings has been, um, I just went out and got the contract price from, from, uh, from Vita for a leased line service similar to what we have. And it comes out to $4,140 a month. Wow. So if you take that $4,140 a month and you multiply it by 51 sites and then you multiply that by 12 months by 14 years, we would have spent over $35 million to transport the data and all we had and, and, and for that same 12 point some million dollars. So that's a savings of $22.9 million over the last um, 14, 15 years uh, for this network. And last thing, I want to talk a little bit about the flexibility. Because the, the cable is in the ground, what goes across it and how much goes across it is determined by what we connect to it. Um, so it's virtually future-proof in that we can just swap out the equipment when we get to a point where we need to get more data or more distance. Moving on to our agreement with the city, we signed an agreement right around the same time that we put the fiber in the ground and it gave the city exclusive right to use 48 strands of our fiber for a 40-year period. The city paid uh, the school board $628,423 um, for the right to use the fiber and then they also paid all of the cost associated to connect their network to our fiber so the school board didn't incur any of that cost. We have a sharing agreement with the city where they share the maintenance costs with us for the fiber optic network and part of that agreement they pay 50 percent of our annual maintenance uh, and they also pay for 50% uh, of the locator services, so most of you are familiar with Miss Utility. So when somebody wants to dig, they call Miss Utility, make sure they don't dig up our fiber. Um, the city pays half of that, and the city pays the cash equivalent of one FTE for our network technician to support the network. Um, we, bill them or we bill them quarterly, and to give you an idea of how much they're paying on an annual basis, it, comes, it came out to about $89,000 during 17-18. Uh, moving on to talk a little bit about our spare capacity. Um, and what you've got is a, a, you're looking at a map of the city, obviously, and I thought it would be helpful if you could see which rings serve which uh, portions of our city. And then I gave you a breakout of what we have total on that ring and then what we have available on the ring. So looking at it, you can see that uh, ring A has the least amount of fiber. So when we talk about how much spare capacity we have, that 90 is the number that we use because we need to be able to connect somebody from one end of the city to the other, which means it has to go across the A ring. Uh, so that's how we come up with the determination of what we have spare. I already told you that hardware upgrades in our future would allow us um, to double or triple the amount of data that we can get across a single strand of fiber if we found ourselves in a situation where we were running out. Right now, with what we have in the ground and what we've already um, uh, agreed to with the city, we have more than enough fiber to meet any foreseeable needs for the division. Um, in looking at how, if we could, if we had to, um, if we got into a point where we were literally running out of fiber because who knows what's going to happen 20 years down the road, um, there is technology that's fairly new that would allow us to, uh, we currently use two strands of fiber for each connection to a building and that's so we have a send and a receive on separate sides. 
there is some new technology that will allow the speeds that we get at the distance we run that use a single strand of fiber. And that would be an option in the future. Um, the reason we're, we, we're not interested in it right now is that it is new technology and it is evolving and there isn't a real standard for it yet. Um, the modules that are available are not, our man, the manufacturer that we use for our network equipment does not recommend that we install these modules into our network and they're not supported by the warranty. Um, so, and, and most importantly, there's no, really no compelling reason, as you can see by the amount of spare fiber that we have available, there's no, there's no compelling reason for us to do that. I'm going to uh, wrap this up by talking a little bit about some of the potential uses. So we have this spare fiber. Uh, we know we're getting ready to, to put in a new uh, a backup network operations center over at Scott Center. So we're going to use some of these, uh, some of these spare strands for that. Uh, some of the other things that we've discussed and we've looked into over the years are the idea of a regional fiber connectivity issues where we're partnering with other school systems or municipalities, and that might be school uh, K-12 school systems on the peninsula, uh, links to colleges and universities like CNU, William & Mary, Thomas Nelson, um, virtual field trip connections to places like the Mariner's Museum, the Peninsula Fine Arts Center, the Virginia Living Museum, and lastly, some uh, some opportunities to partner with uh, with folks on STEM opportunities. So Jefferson Labs, Newport News Shipbuilding, and New Horizons. And what that would allow us to do, if we if we had a direct connection to these people, obviously we can currently connect to them over the internet. But having a private connection to them um, saves us on bandwidth costs going to the internet, and it also provides a more reliable and private connection for the to to bring the two networks together. Um, so that's my presentation. I know it's riveting to talk about technology infrastructure, but I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Mr. Brown. Mr. All right. Brown. Well, I want you to know I am riveted. Uh, <laughs> by this, and, and I do find this to be very exciting. Um, I am very interested to know, can we and how do we, uh, if it's possible, connect this fiber to our students' homes to provide internet to the students in their homes? Um, uh, firstly, that would require us to partner with somebody mm -hmm. um, who is going to provide that, what we would call, in, in communications, they would call that the last mile. Um, so we do have the fiber connectivity out there. And um, I can think of a number of ways that we could partner with people um, to, uh, to backhaul the traffic um, from from somebody who was going to handle that actual connectivity to the homes. And obviously there are some challenges in, um, you know, Here. Verizon has a business of installing this stuff. And if you called today and tried to get it, it might take three weeks to get it done. So you can imagine what it would be like for, um, for a private organization to, to start talking about installing things in people's homes. But it's certainly something in these, um, you know, I mentioned on the previous slide, um, the um, the um, regional fiber connectivity initiatives. I know on the south side there is a, a group where, of cities that have partnered, and uh, they're sharing uh, connectivity basically to build smarter networks, smart networks for for their cities. Uh, so certainly that's an opportunity. But the the key would be that it would have to be through some kind of partnership. In in doing in doing that. Um, are there sufficient numbers of strands? Is there um, additional cost to us? Um, the additional cost to us would be in that we would have to keep the traffic separate from our NNPS network um, because of uh, the, some of the funding that we get requires that our network, portions of our network, specifically the internet connection, can only be used for NNPS students for educational purposes. So we would get into some issues where everything would have to be completely separate, but the infrastructure is there. Okay, and in terms of the 90 strands that we believe we have in excess now, if we uh, wanted to pursue in the future uh, connecting to students' homes, losing the 90 strands, we could still, we still have a sufficient number of cables to make the connections? Uh, well, we would, we would need to look at, so if we partnered with somebody, we would need to see what their overall design looks like. But I believe... Um, just, just for a point of clarif clarification, how much does it cost to connect? When the city plugs into our fiber, there's a cost that they incur. 
So I think what we're asking is if we did a connection last mile mm -hmm. from our fiber to a residential area uh, in terms of cost on without a partnership, what what would the, around the cost? What what would that be? Because I think there was a significant cost to connect to our fiber. Well, from a, from a specific building. I don't have the, the numbers in front of me for the city, but I seem to remember them paying um, more for the vendor to install their portion of right. the fiber than they paid us for the actual fiber strands. Okay. So I, I believe they paid over a half a million dollars right. just to get the, the short distance from, I believe it was one of their fire stations, to our fiber ring. So the, the answer to that question is yes, there would be a significant cost to the school division without some, some level of partnership that would allow those connections to exist um, because those connections will would, would incur a significant cost. I have a question. Is the fiber, is it built like under the ground? It yes. is underground, yeah. sir, yes. So what would happen once the, the student graduate if we connect to their house? You have to... Well, we, we wouldn't run our fiber. Our fiber doesn't run into the neighborhoods. Our no, fiber yeah, runs to the school. school. You could that. So there will be a maintenance involved well, and anything yeah. else with that. With that as well, pretty much almost being a provider like Verizon or something. Right. So it would, it would be very, very... Um, Intensive. There are some cities that are, are doing partnerships where they're trying to provide Wi-Fi access, yeah. and and um, and that is a more likely solution if we were to if we were to partner with somebody or what some of the other cities are doing is they're leveraging these initiatives are, are kind of becoming a co-op where they're sharing fiber to say okay we want to reach this neighborhood and we look at who has fiber in that area and are they willing to let us use it and. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else does all the work of setting up the Wi-Fi and getting people connected to it. Because honestly, we're just not set up for that kind of um, for that kind of infrastructure. And so, support. in those situations, is it a um, a Wi-Fi connection to a regional neighborhood, and then the wi there's Wi-Fi broadcasted, leveraging the fiber mm -hmm. in the ground. Yes, sir. Wi-Fi to a neighborhood. Yes, sir. How many assignments? I mean, that, that's why I think having these community centers in our buildings, like the Discovery STEM Academy, that do have fast internet connection potential, and in the New Huntington, is so important because communities can come into the schools to access um, the really fast internet. Um, and I, I think that that is a, a service that we can provide the community, especially if we got volunteers willing to staff like almost like a, a library in the evenings so that the community can come in and use and use our our fast Wi-Fi or I mean our fast internet. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, in your package. 5.05, the attendance report, 5.06, the membership report, 5.07, the construction report, or part of your package. Does, does anyone have any questions on those? There being none, uh, we'll move to um, item 5.08, comments by our Dr. Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I know there were uh, some attendees in, at the Bloom Conference uh, for our young lady, so I'm going to reserve uh, uh, some reflection from uh, those board members who did uh, who did attend and not steal their thunder. But uh, I just want to say I was very proud to, uh, un unfortunately, I was at another obligation uh, that, that day, but I was just so proud to hear that that uh, event went well. And uh, Maria, I'm so proud that you uh, were one of the initiators of the Bloom uh, uh, Conference and Opportunity for Students. Uh, as stated earlier this evening, this is uh, American Education Week, and our students and staff are celebrating the annual observance by promoting the greater uh, great things happening in our schools. I want to take a moment to thank all the families, the PTAs, the members of, our, of the community who are visiting our schools and participating in many activities taking place this week in our classrooms. Uh, the festivities will uh, con conclude this week, but we just want to continue the spirit of uh, supporting American uh, public education in particular uh, in America and what it does uh, in terms of changing lives for our students and families. <coughs> Uh, this week is also School Psychology Awareness Week, and I want to thank our school psychologists for all they do to promote healthy and safe learning uh, environments. Our psychologists provide crucial support services for our students and their families. Uh, they apply expertise in mental health, uh, learning, and behavior to help students succeed academically, socially, and emotionally. Uh, thank you for supporting our students. 
I look forward to the upcoming Take Your Legislator to School Day on Wednesday, November 28th. Uh, we have a nice program planned for our local uh, elected officials and those who will be in attendance. Uh, it will be, a, I, I can assure them it will be time well spent uh, in our schools with our teachers, with our students, and, uh, and supporting uh, Newport News Public Schools. Uh, we're hoping that we'll get a great turnout with our city council, business and community leaders. Hopefully will join us as well on that, on that day and always looking forward to the bus tour. Uh, I will also be hosting the first uh, State of the Schools address on third, the f next day, on Thursday, November 29th uh, at 6.30 p.m. Uh, at the David Student Union Ballroom on the campus of Christ Christopher Newport uh, University. So I'm encouraging family, staff, and the community to come out and join me uh, as I share some of the highlights uh, from uh, my first 100 days in Newport News Public Schools. And, uh, and I'll highlight certain uh, student achievement, uh, successful partnerships, and the work uh, as it relates to moving our strategic plan forward in Newport News. Uh, invitations will be sent out for a special re uh, a reception prior to that event, that, uh, but the actual program will begin at 6.30 at CNU, so I encourage those to um, our community to come out and support. Uh, I'd like to remind all students and parents that school will be closed for, uh, for students on Wednesday through Friday, November 21st and 23rd for the Thanksgiving holiday. And I wish everyone a safe and, uh, Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, that concludes my comments, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Parker. At this time, we'll move to item number six. Do we have any more cards there? Card. There being no cards, we'll move on to item number seven, matters by the school board. We have first up uh, uh, Ms. Jones. Um, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, just, wow, it's a kind of a lot to say. Okay, so, um, but I'll go quickly. The first one I really want to thank, so Bloom. Unfortunately, I was unable to attend. I was in Los Angeles, California, for the National League of Cities Conference. I was there with the Mayor's Youth Commission representing the city of Newport News. But um, since I've, I was alerted to receiving the award, I didn't know, however, that they were coming to present it to me tonight. So since I got it, I've just been looking down on it and smiling. It is honestly out of the many things that I've done. It's one of the things that I'm most proud of because it's something that is continuing on and that not only the girls who are who have the amazing fortune of attending it can see but the people outside of it the community and the parents and their relatives and even people outside of Hampton Roads are really seeing the impact that it has so it just it makes me so proud to know how big it's become and it makes me so proud to know that I got the opportunity to work with Miss Adams on planning it I'm like starting to tear up talking about it um it's just it's it's awesome um as far as the award recipients for the wise awards um they're not here anymore but you know congratulations that's an awesome award i remember mr brown was my personal finance teacher and last year when he got the award i was sitting in the front row <laughs> and i was taking personal finance online and i hadn't turned any of my assignments for that quarter yet so i kind of shrunk in my seat hoping he wouldn't see me but he caught me and he made sure i did my assignments and i passed the class with an a he made sure we passed um as far as um, LA, it was amazing. It was an amazing conference. It was geared towards political advocacy and civic engagement in youth. However, there is a lot that I learned um, that I was able to take back and apply towards my academic career, specifically me being a student leader on the school board. I learned that there's a lot of resources available to not only cities, but school boards as well. Um, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to not only present that to some of you guys, but also city council, watch out. I will be at city council meetings, um, a state legislature, watch out. You will see my face and the White House will also see my face as well. So um, I am prepared and I'm gonna take over the world. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, Dr. Bess. Uh, good evening, I'll be brief um, as well. I had the opportunity to attend the Blooms Conference on Friday night for the rally and award ceremony. It was absolutely um, amazing. We were greeted with cheerleaders coming into the building. So my girls, they were like, what is, what is this all about? And I was like, just enjoy it. And just enjoy it. And that is exactly what they um, did. It was just the, the positivity, the, the older girls leading the younger girls, the well-oiled machine, how it operated. Everything had a purpose, it was timely, it was relevant, it was just indescribable. So Ms. Bridget Adams, just hats off to you and your staff. It was absolutely um, amazing. 
Also had an opportunity to attend the <coughs> library uh, rededication at Newsom Park Elementary School, and I shared with the attendees that that school held, held a special place in my heart because it was the my first grade school is the first school that I attended in Newport News uh, Public Schools. But as I was sitting here reflecting for a minute, I thought about the 50-year lifespan of schools. That school opened in 1967, the new school. So in the year 2027, it'll be 50 years old. So we'll be talking about replacing Newsom Park. But moving right along, I attended a Veterans Day ceremony at Greenwood Elementary School. The kids were so excited. The parents were so grateful. And the veterans, they were just um, in awe, and they were very thankful for the cards and just the appreciation that the students show. But we do want our parents that are veterans to know we do um, appreciate you. Um, I serve on the Special Ed Advisory Committee, had an opportunity to attend my first meeting. And as a former school employee, I know what the Special Education Department does is, is awesome in, in youth development, but to sit in a meeting, Hats off, hats off to you, the, the detailed of, of what it takes to be in compliance of such a regulated part of the educational system and how it's ever changing and the needs of students. The guest uh, presenter talked about autism and I know 20 years ago we didn't really talk about that. So just it's, for me the first nine weeks, the students talk about the first nine weeks, but the first nine weeks for me as a school board member had just has been very eye-opening. I have grown, and I'm looking forward to growing more and learning more, so I, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bess. Um, this is Simons. I also <clears throat> really enjoyed stopping by the Bloom Conference on um, Saturday and seeing all the excitement and energy. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe we need to um, see if we can partner with the 100 plus men organization and, and have something similar for, for the, the young men in our community, because I think it's, it really is empowering. Um, I also wanted to really thank um, Mr. Finneran for the report on the legislative agenda. I am really excited about it. I mean, I think that it is amazing. We're focusing on such important things, school safety, teacher salaries, and also school construction. Because I think we do have a moment right now in the state of Virginia where there might be some extra revenue generated to help us with schools. And um, as his report shows, there really is no funding coming from the state of Virginia for school construction right now. That ended with the recession and ended around 2010. So um, there's a little bit of money in this literary fund, but it hasn't been used. Nobody's gotten any of that money since 2012. So we need a plan, and we need to talk to our state legislators about a plan to help us, because it is very rough on city councils and localities around Virginia to deal with these aging school buildings. Right now, um, our average school is over 50 years old. So we have to recognize that there's a crisis brewing. And you know, if they would help us with some um, maybe bonds, we, we could you know, generate the, the funding um, to pay down those loans. But we, we need a way to finance school construction in Newport News. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Simon. Uh, Mr. Ely. Thank you. Well, the Bloom Conference was amazing. They said it was for ladies, but I wanted to see what it was about. <laughs> Those girls was having an amazing time. They were dancing. They were singing. It was just great fellowship. So the guys, we're going to have one coming up soon. <laughs> I also had the opportunity to attend um, Huntington Alumni Candlelight Visual. It was very good to see the unity of the community come together and the fellowship. I was out there along with Dr. Bass and Dr. Sandra Chair from Council. And just for to see the community that wants and needs and their support of a new Huntington Middle School was very great. It felt it was very heartwarming to let us know as city officials, as well as the community know, they want another school in their community. And us as elected officials have to make sure that happens and realize that it's not about us. It's about the community and it's about the children. And I feel once we as leaders take that standpoint, letting the community know what they want and give them what they want, I think we definitely, and we will going to build another Huntington Middle School. So a special thanks to everybody who came out to the Candlelight Visual. It was very great and very well organized. Also tomorrow, we're, I'm partnering with 
Ivy Baptist Church in Heritage High School. We're doing a community dinner, Thanksgiving dinner. We feed in the community. We're prepared to feed over a thousand citizens. We're going to have fun and games. It's totally free for everyone. We've got bounce houses. We're going to have basketball games. We're going to have entertainment. We're going to have choirs performing. So definitely, um, if you're in the area, please come out tomorrow from 4 to 7 at Heritage High School. I'm also working um, with the, the community on a Wonder on Washington Holiday Parade. It's going to be December the 15th, and it's going to be on Washington Avenue in Newport News. So far, we have over 65 units that's confirmed to be in the parade. We have bands, drill teams, community organizations, and dance teams. So if you are interested in going, just shoot me an email, and I'll definitely forward it over to the right people to make sure you're in the holiday parade. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ely. I miss uh, Lisa Sir Laws. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. <coughs> Beckerdite for her um, very inclusive um, presentation this evening. Um, this is uh, an area that I think Newport News Public Schools does very well, and it's good to hear how we do that. So thank you for your time this evening. Um, I got the chance to go to the Newsom Park um, STEM uh, opening and it was just wonderful to see the space that is designed for students in that school. Um, what I enjoyed though really was the contractors who were there with the opening and the, the joy that they saw on their face to see how that building is going to be used and to see that space um, that they created uh, for the students was really an encouragement. Um, I got to hear some neat stories about the children who are starting to spend time there. Uh, behavior is changing in the building as they're getting uh, possibilities to take leadership roles and keeping the space uh, rolling and moving. Uh, I think that is very um, insightful on the group to, to do that for the students. Um, and I also enjoyed seeing the parents see that their children are in a good space. Um, the Bloom Conference, I guess I got to get on that bandwagon. Uh, it was absolutely delightful. I, you know, things come on your calendar and you say, I should do this. So I decided, yes, I'm going to stop there on my way home. Well, I think I had been there about an hour and I got a buzz from home, what's for dinner? And I said, pizza. <laughs> because I was going to stay until the end. It was just wonderful. Um, Mrs. Adams just, uh, puts her heart and soul into that. And watching her do that has the children do that, has the students do that. The cheerleaders from Woodside, they could have been doing anything that evening, but they were there to help lead these uh, young women. And it was a very fun time for all. And I guess my last thing is I'm pretty excited about our joint uh, meeting with uh, city council um, for the capital improvement plan. Um, this is where the rubber hits the road, and this is what we're here for. So I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Brown. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, I wish I had uh, Mr. Tremaine Knight uh, here to uh, uh, write some words for me. He's, he um, <laughs> uh, really gave a, 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 an impassioned speech. I think I'm always very encouraged, especially when we see young people. Yeah. Uh, it lets us know how well we're educating our young people yeah. to see. Uh, we had two students tonight yeah. who came out and spoke to the board. Uh, I think uh, regardless of, uh, of where we come down or whether we agree, it's, it's always so wonderful to hear someone uh, articulate their thoughts so well. I heard uh, great rhetoric there, uh, you know, snake shedding its skin and all that. I'm not going to do that well here <laughs> with my few uh, comments here at the end. Uh, but uh, that is uh, very encouraging to, to see how our youth are becoming college career and citizen ready. Are uh, you uh, adults? You can take a lesson from our young people. We had two students come out. I didn't see, you know, I don't see too many adults come out to our board meetings. I'm always happy to hear from the community and the public whether I agree with you or not, and always happy to, to hear the questions and hear the challenges of, of how you want us to move forward. <clears throat> and that's um, really, I think, a theme uh, for us, uh, you know, not just tonight, but at, all the time that Newport News Public Schools were constantly moving forward and getting uh, lots of forward momentum. Uh, I'm going to be at the Virginia School Board Association uh, conference uh, this week. And tremendous, we'll see forward momentum there. We'll see uh, progress uh, that we've done. Uh, Newport News Public Schools will be on display and celebrated. I believe that we're going to be, uh, uh, 
one of the speakers at the conference because of our selection process and our superintendent search that we did such a uh, great job that we were selected to uh, present at the conference so again moving moving forward uh, always uh, making improvements we had some selections of some new uh, principals this evening I'm looking forward to some great things uh, at Warwick High School and Woodside High School again moving forward uh, moving forward we've had <clears throat> gone from uh, in 2008 it was 72 0.9 percent in terms of our graduation rate today it's 93 percent so constantly moving forward dropout rates gone from 12 percent down to 2.1 percent constantly moving forward it was visionary we got fiber optic cable when other school divisions weren't even thinking about it constantly moving forward now you hear me talking about it what about what's about next how can, can we uh, get internet access to all of our students homes constantly moving forward constantly moving forward uh, making that next step we do, we do have a crisis right now. We need to move forward on uh, replacing our schools. We have a capital crisis. As you heard, the average um, age of a school building, the average lifespan of a building is 50 years. Well, the average age of our school buildings is 50 years old. So we're already in a crisis. We've already had uh, issues and things happen with, with Huntington. We know we have issues with Warwick and with Denby High School as well, and, and other schools in our division that are past their age, long in the tooth, as they say. So we're, we're already in the crisis, live in the crisis, and so we have to uh, treat it that way. We're constantly moving forward, and I know that we, we will um, get the average age of our buildings reduced uh, in the coming years, and uh, we're, we'll be in a strong position like we always have, always have been, and we continue to produce those kinds of results. So I'm encouraged about uh, this, this coming year and, and what we're gonna see in the next month. We are gonna have a great meeting uh, with our, our council members uh, and have some good discussion there on how we can all move forward together. We're going to have a state of the schools address. So the community is going to get a chance to hear about how we can move forward. Uh, that's going to be a Thursday night at Christopher Newport University again. I believe that is uh, November the 29th. 29th. November the 20, 29th at 6.30 p.m. John, time to move forward. All right. So um, looking forward to this month. Y'all have a happy Thanksgiving and uh, enjoy some time with your families and look forward to seeing you again next month. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brown. Well, I guess it's me between you and us going home. So, again, there's great things are happening here at Newport <laughs> News Public Schools. Um, I just want to reiterate again uh, about the four young folks that came up to, folks to speak with us today, the two who gave the invocation and the pledge to the flag, uh, Mr. Tremaine Knight, who, uh, again, I use that word a lot when he says how to eat an elephant. That's one bite at a time. And so I'm glad that he did come out to speak uh, in, in, in with one – one movement at a time. And so we'll see, I'm quite sure that the school system will uh, take, see what he has on a plate and see if we can move anyway. Uh, again, uh, congratulations again to Ms. Jones for that great accolade uh, that was uh, delivered by one of your friends and your students. Uh, congratulations again. Again, I was at uh, Greenwood Elementary, again, for the veterans. Uh, Thank you for showing up, uh, Dr. Bess. Um, I didn't know I could march around the building twice with so many brave fanfare, but it was unbelievable that the morale of the students in that school, um, it, it was, it, I, I was happy all day. I went back and showed the video to the folks that, where I work at, and they were just amazed at the energy in that particular school. Uh, again, I'm looking forward to our state of the schools. Dr. Parker, I think this is a good time. It will be a good opportunity for the public uh, to come out and to hear uh, what a true state of the schools is. And, and hopefully we can get some more momentum. I I'm, will say tonight, I miss my Huntington folk. And I imagine <laughs> and they're, they're at city council. <laughs> That's what I realized that they were at city council. Um, um, supporting uh, the Huntington. <laughs> so, uh, I, so again, I know they're looking out there. Uh, you were missed, but I know exactly where you were. <laughs> so again, thank you for continuing to support uh, your dreams and the school system dreams. Uh, I want everyone to have a safe and happy Thanksgiving Day for those who are traveling, much like myself. Uh, safe travels on the road. Uh, don't eat too much turkey. And, <laughs> and uh, as I always say, uh, this, after next week, it's the, it's the best time of the year for me. Uh, Thanksgiving opens up a special time for me and my family and hopefully to the country. Um, folks are typically uh, more happy. Uh, they're more generous. 
And then for those who may not uh, be so fortunate, just reach your hand out and say hello, give them a hand. We were at a food drive this week with uh, one of the local churches and a Divine Nine at Hampton University on Sunday. It was just great unity. So at this time of year, um, I pray for all those folks again who are out there in California, those fires. And um, again, uh, we pray for them and hope they have the best Thanksgiving they can possibly have. It's another service I want to bring to, uh, to the front when it deals with schools. If you heard on TV, there's been some terrible accidents with folks driving around buses. And uh, we, that came up a couple of years ago. We've talked about it. And I would ask again that this board, again, reconsider about, you know, taking that thing up again, about having that extended arm on the buses. I'm telling you, kids, when a car comes around a bus at 40 miles an hour, I mean, you see what happened. Twins are passed. The sisters, they, a sister died. Uh, folks are busy in the morning. And, and I, go, I go to work every morning. I drive about 17 miles. I can't believe the number of times I ride by someone who's on the phone going down 64 at 75 miles an hour passing me in, in, in the slow lane or in the fast lane. And um, when it comes to kids, uh, and I think we as board members that we need to do all we can for the protection of our kids. We have, we transport 25,000 kids, 24,000 kids each and every day on buses. And so I, I want this board to at least consider um, our discussion and bring that discussion up again about the safety of our kids on buses. And that being said, um, no one has anything else. Again, have a safe Thanksgiving, and we'll see you uh, next month. I, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you.